Hey class, it's me, Professor Thompson. Welcome back. We're doing class again. Asynchronous learning is where it is at. I hope you are staying well and safe. Make sure to wash your hands because I know that you have not washed your hands in the last hour and that is disgusting. Go wash your hands right now, then come back. I'll be here. We're going to be talking about chapters six and seven today or tomorrow, whenever you are listening to this, maybe even two days from now, or maybe in preparation for our open book test. All right, uh, go, go to the next slide, you goofballs. Just real quick side tangent. Have you guys ever seen an armadillo up close? Like, look, look at that little guy with his weird little armadillo mouth and those little weird armadillo hairs. Ah, get out of here, armadillo. So we're talking about research, and uh, I'm still hung up on the armadillo, but there are two different approaches to research, quantitative and qualitative. When you hear quantitative, think quantities. You're counting something, right? So if I'm looking at the number of fingers on my hand, right, that would be a quantity. I have five on one hand, right? Uh, if I look at the number of uh, drinks that I've had this week from stress, it would be 72. That's a quantity. Now, qualitative research is focused on the qualities of things. I'm describing things. So if I'm describing the taste of the alcohol that I had, I would say that the taste is enough to get the job done. Doesn't really matter, right? Now, when you're doing quantitative research, it's very easy to take all that information and compile it, right? If I have the quantitative research of like uh, how much or what everybody's grade was in the class, I can very easy take all, uh, very easily take all of that information and then get an average, right? Now, if I asked everybody how they felt about the most recent test, that would be qualitative. Some people might give me like a whole paragraph about how they felt. Some people might just say, fine. Now, if I have one person telling me, well, you know, I really thought that it was going to be different. Uh, you know, I did okay overall, but there were some questions that felt like they were out of left field and there was a typo on a question. And I have another person who says, fine, right? How do I find the average of those two answers? That's the downside of qualitative information. So in research, what we're doing is we're going between quantitative, counting things, and qualitative, describing things. So if you were to say, try to look at a specific phenomenon, right? Uh, maybe I'm studying grades in the class. So what I might want to do is get quantitative information. The first thing I might want to do is just see, on average, how people are doing in the class. Maybe I give out a quiz and then I see how well people do on that quick quiz. Then after I get that average, so maybe the average grade was a 75. That's okay. So I might want to get quantitative information. I might ask students, what subjects did you uh, struggle with? What questions were harder for you? And that qualitative information, it's going to be very diverse, right? Uh, when you have qualitative information, you're getting a lot of information, and it takes a long time to go uh, through all that information and organize it. But you have a lot of information, and that's the good thing. Once I have that qualitative information, I can go back to quantitative information. Uh, so let's say people struggled with ethics. So I might, ask, I might ask the class, how many people want to review some of the things that we talked about when we were talking about chapter three, ethics? And I can count the number of, man, I need to silence all of my phones, all of my phones.
uh, I can count the number of people who raise their hand, and if 17 students say that they want to review that material, now that I have that quantitative information, I can make a decision. So in research, we're going from quantitative to qualitative, back to quantitative, back to qualitative, and we can start with one and go to the other, uh, but both of those are important to understand any specific phenomena. So one last thing that I want to talk about for chapter six is what's called naturalistic observation. Sometimes you get the opportunity to study something in the field where it's actually happening. So instead of me bringing people into my laboratory or my classroom to do a survey about marital behaviors, I might actually watch people do things as they would normally do them. So if I were to say, sit uh, with a married couple as they were having dinner and just watch, right? That would be naturalistic observation. There's a difference between bringing, you know, gorillas into uh, a laboratory and doing experiments on them versus going to the actual forest or wherever. Where do gorillas live? Forest, savannas, tundras, uh, wherever those uh, gorillas might go, I might go out into the world and watch them. This is naturalistic observation. You're doing it out in the field, out in the real world. This is going to have greater external validity because it's going to reflect what you might actually see in the real world. Now, there are two issues that you might have to deal with when you're doing naturalistic uh, observation. Uh, so one of those issues is participation. So if I am participating in the thing that I am observing, that could bias the research, right? So if I'm wondering what it's like to be in one of your groups, uh, so I just decide to do your group project with you, you guys might act differently because I'm participating in the group. Uh, you might normally swear at each other and uh, threaten each other uh, and talk, uh, you know, crap about me. I almost swore. I'm not going to swear. Uh, but uh, you might say terrible things about me. But if I'm in your group, you're going to act differently than you normally would. So my participation affects the results that I see. The other issue is concealment. People change their behavior when they know they're being watched. So let's say I wanted to uh, see how you study for the class, right? So if you know that I'm standing there with you watching you, I'm not participating, I'm just watching, right? Because you know that I'm watching, you might change the way you study. You might sit upright, you might turn the TV off, right? Uh, you might uh, wear nicer clothes. Maybe you like study in pajamas, but you might put on, you know, some uh, like a collared shirt and a fun hat, you know, because it's serious study time. So the fact that you know that I'm watching you is going to change your behavior. So the presence of the researcher either actively participating or just being uh, visible and people knowing that they're being watched could affect the results that the researcher gets. Okay, just real quick, what is the deal with zebras? First of all, it's pronounced zebra, okay? It's actually pronounced zebra. We've been saying it wrong our entire lives. What is, look at these weird little creatures. Like, what is, what is this? What is this little mane thing it's got? Like, why is it so, like, why is it so, like, upright? And look at these long, goofy ears that it has. Like, this, this isn't, uh, the stripes are cool. Uh, I'm going to say these are cool stripes. Uh, drawing with this thing is very difficult. That's my rant for the day. Uh, look at that weird nose. That, like, I don't want to body shame zebras right now because that seems unfair. But zebras are the, uh, they're getting burned today. So sorry to all you zebra fans out there. <laughs> sorry, zebra fans. Uh, but you got to find a new animal to love.
So at some point you are going to be creating questions on a survey and there are three main categories of questions that you can be asking. Uh, one is about facts and demographics. Ooh, very exciting. So facts and demographics are specific things about someone. You might ask their gender. You might ask what their GPA is. You might ask what their hair color is, what city they're born in, uh, how many times they've uh, gone to a, uh, I don't know, I ran out of examples. Uh, <laughs> but the but facts and demographics are just specific uh, biographical things about a person, race, gender, hair color, things like that. Sometimes you'll ask about behaviors right here. Behaviors are things that people have done. If you look at a lot of personality tests, they measure your behaviors. How likely are you to initiate conversation with a stranger at a bar? How many times uh, have you gotten so drunk that you've passed out? How many joints do you smoke in a week, right? These are behaviors that we are trying to measure. We also have attitudes and beliefs. Uh, so if you've ever uh, gotten a service from a company and they sent you like a form that like a little survey to see how they did, uh, on a scale of one to five, how would you rate uh, our service? Did the person who helped you seem like they cared about you, right? These are your attitudes and, you believe, uh, and your beliefs. Would you recommend us to uh, one of your friends. These are uh, things that you personally feel, and this is another thing that you can measure. So when you're designing your survey, you can think, well, what are we trying to measure, right? And then you measure things based off of that. So maybe you're measuring somebody's uh, video game usage. You can uh, look for facts, right? Uh, uh, which would be like, do you own an Xbox? Uh, you could look at behaviors, which would be uh, how often do you play video games per week in hours, right? Or you could look at their attitudes or beliefs. I think that video games provide a opportunity for me to spend time with people that I care about, right? Facts and demographics, behaviors, attitudes, and beliefs. Now, sometimes you can ask a bad question. Now, you want to make sure that your questions are designed in such a way so that you can get good information. This is internal validity. You want to make sure that your study is designed well enough that the information that you get from the study is useful. So there are five things that we're going to talk about that can make your questions bad. Simplicity, double-barreled questions, loaded questions, negative wording, yay saying, or nay saying. Simplicity is just what it sounds like. Your questions should make sense to the person who's reading them. There are those like fancy hoity-toity ways of saying things, and they're just straightforward ways of asking a question, right? Uh, if I could ask you, have you ever used a THC product, or have you ever smoked weed, right? Uh, one makes you think a little bit longer. The other one, you're like, yes or no, right? The other is a double, uh, sorry, a double-barreled question. If you're asking a question, you want to ask one question per question. An example of this is, do you want ice cream and cake, right? Maybe you love ice cream, and maybe you hate cake. If you love both, it's great. But in order to answer that question, if it's a yes or no question, you might end up getting two things that you don't actually want. That would be a double-barreled question. We also have loaded questions. So there are certain ways of asking things that can lead somebody into uh, answering one way or the other. I could ask you, are you a vegetarian or... Do you believe that animals should be slaughtered for, you know, human growth and development, right? Two 
I mean, technically both the same thing, but uh, the one way leads you because uh, nobody wants to think of like animals being slaughtered, and if you do, you you might be a sociopath. Uh, but uh, most of us would want to say no, even if we do eat meat. So you want to make sure that your questions aren't biased. That's a loaded question. We also have negative wording. Okay. Uh, do you not want me to stop giving examples? Yes or no? The that's hard for our brains to wrap around. Uh, so uh, wrap our minds around. It's hard for our brains to wrap themselves or whatever. Uh, it's a confusing way of asking the question. Questions should be phrased in the positive. Would you like me to continue this lecture? Right. Uh, and then that's where you say no, and then you shut it off, and then listen tomorrow. I get it. Uh, there are there's also yay saying and nay saying. So this is when uh, you're filling out a survey, and all the questions are phrased in the same way. And if you've ever like done an evaluation for a class, sometimes you just rush through it uh, without even. Re really like reading and considering all the questions because you're just like, well, I hate this professor, so I'm just going to give them a one on everything. Oh, I love this professor. They're going to get a five on everything, right? So you're either yay saying, answering in the positive for everything, or nay saying, answering in the negative for everything. So I'll give you some more examples of these in the following slides. So here's an example of a question that could be worded more simply. Do you prefer central nervous system depressants for their intoxicating effects, their amelioration of anxiety, or to aid in somnolence? Right? Uh, I'll give you a chance to figure out what that's asking. Uh, a simpler way of phrasing this would be, hey, uh, do you drink because it gets you drunk? because it makes you feel less anxious or because it helps you go to sleep, right? That's an easy question to answer. So definitely, if you can, phrase your questions in a way that makes it so that anyone who's reading your question understands what you are asking. This is an example of a double-barreled question. Should we cancel a final exam, something that some of you might really enjoy and give everyone an A, right? And also add a 25-page individual research paper, something that you wouldn't like. If I want to know what the class wants, I should ask those questions separately, right? Because if some of you want the maybe some of you want the paper and uh, uh, don't want to get rid of the final, right? You have to pick both in order to get the one that you want. So you really want to make sure that you are, uh, any question that you have that is asking multiple things, you can just break it up into separate questions, right? Or let's say maybe you're measuring depression. We know that depression can affect your appetite and sleep. So if I ask the question, have you, experienced it, uh, have you experienced in the past month any changes in your appetite and sleep? If somebody's only had changes in their sleep, then they're probably not going to answer yes, because you should have uh, split it into two questions. Have you had any changes in your appetite in the past month? Yes or no. Have you had any changes in your sleep in the past month? Yes or no. So you really want to be careful of double-barreled questions. This is a loaded question. Uh, do you believe that we as a civilized society should stop the barbaric practice of butchering the genitals of infant boys? If you believe in male genital mutilation, then you are obviously a horrible person. These poor little baby boys who are having their genitals mutilated because of you. Or maybe I'm just talking about circumcision, right? So if I phrase something in a way that's that negative, 
anybody, pro-circumcision or not, is going to go, ooh, genital mutilation sounds terrible, right? Uh, so you want to make sure that things are phrased in a way that don't show bias. Because when you show that bias, you're telling people that you want them to react in a certain way, and oftentimes they will. If you think about why we call pro-life and pro-choice what we do, it's a similar thing, right? Uh, be, saying that you're pro-abortion or anti-abortion, there's some weight to that. Uh, but no one wants to say that they hate life. And no one's going to want to say that they hate freedom. So if you're not pro-life, then that must mean that you're anti-life, right? If you are not pro-choice, then are you against women having autonomy over their bodies? So by asking things in a loaded way, that's a showing our specific bias. So we always want to make sure that we are stating things in a clear way without bias so that we can get good data. And here's an example of negative wording, right? If you notice when you read through it, your brain has to like stop and think about it for a second because you, so if I say yes, does that mean that I don't want short answers? Sorry, not put short answers on your exam. So I don't want exams, so I should say yes, right? Uh, the easiest way to phrase that is to say, do you want short answers on your exams, yes or no? If you don't want them, you say no, right? With negative wording, and sometimes you'll see questions that are like, which one of these isn't the right answer? Uh, and then you're like, uh, so whenever you have to do that mental math on a question, in a similar sense, uh, simplicity is the same thing. You don't want people to have to think about what your question means, they should intuitively understand it based off of how you phrase the question. So here's just a very quick uh, example of yay saying and nay saying. Now, you guys, obviously, all of you love me. You all think I'm the best teacher in the world. You are getting very sleepy. Uh, oh, should I do like an ASMR thing? Uh, hey, it's me talking and I'm in one ear and I'm in the other ear. Is this working? I don't know. Uh, but uh, if you have a positive opinion of me, then you can very quickly know that if you just say yes, right, uh, you'll be done with the survey. If you have a negative opinion of me, you're just going to say no to everything. So even if you think that I'm organized, nice, and that I listen, uh, you might not think that I know stuff, right? You might not think that I'm cool, and you might not think that I have dank memes. But what might happen is because... Uh, you're trying to rush through the survey because maybe I did the thing where the survey was the last thing uh, that we were doing in class. I'm like, once you finish it, you can leave class, right? You might be rushing through it and you might just go all the way down the column for yes instead of reading each question and thinking about it. So what I could do is I can throw in some what are called reverse coded questions, right? Uh, so uh, I could make one that says, Professor Thompson is mean, or Professor Thompson is not cool, right? So if you said yes to one of those, then that would actually be a negative point, right? Uh, so you actually, uh, if there are some that are phrased negatively, and I know we just talked about negative wording, but in this case, it's okay, because uh, we are, uh, it's not saying uh, Professor Thompson is not blah, 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 and it's not that confusing. Uh, you could say something like, uh, Professor Thompson uh, smells bad, right? Yes or no. So you would have to stop, read it, and understand it before moving on. So you want to be careful about yay saying or nay saying, because you don't want people 
to inflate their answers and or you know deflate them i guess would be the opposite of that uh because they just wanted to rush the the survey by throwing in some ones that are negative right uh then it ensures that people are going to answer and like read each question and think about it before they answer So now we're going to talk about the population and the sample. Uh, when we're talking about the sample in research, you will always see the capital N. So if I saw N equals 30, that would mean that there would be 30 people in my sample. Your population is always the group that you are trying to study. The sample is who you use to study that group. So if I wanted to study uh, what my current class thought of my teaching style, that would be a population of 35 students. Now, I might not be able to talk to all 35 of you, so I might just email five of you randomly, and that would be the sample. And hopefully, the five people who I talk to represent the 35 people who I'm trying to understand. As you might guess, sometimes your sample doesn't reflect your population. So it's very important to understand how you get people into your sample so you can make sure that your sample reflects the population. So the best way to get people into your sample is what is called random sampling. It is a type of probability sampling, which just refers to the fact that uh, everyone has an equal-ish chance of getting into your sample. So there are other types of probability sampling, which you'll see if you read the book, but I really just want you to focus on random sampling. Now, when we say random, a lot of people think that random is like, I like rap music, but I also like metal. I'm so random. That is not random. Uh, random refers to the fact that there is an equal chance of every possibility. So if you were to roll a die, right, that is random. I mean, it's not purely random, but it's random enough. There is a one in six chance that it will land on any of those sides of the die. If you are the type of person who like puts syrup and ketchup on their eggs, that's weird and it's unexpected, but it's not random. So when we're talking about randomness, we're talking about an equal chance of any possibility happening. So Back in my example that I gave previously with the class, right, I just looked at the first five names on the attendance sheet, and I asked those five people for feedback. Now, that's not random, because the people whose last names start with, like, S and T and V, they didn't have an equal chance of being in the study. In order for it to be random, everyone in the class would need to have an equal chance of being in that little sample. So when we are talking about randomness, everyone in your population needs to have an equal chance of being in your sample. At this point, you should be thinking, can I do random sampling in my study? And the answer is no you will very likely be unable to do random sampling because in order to do random sampling, you need to have access to everybody in your, that's right, population. I'm just going to assume that you said population right there. If you didn't, it's fine. Just go back, say population, and I'm just going to pretend like, I'm not going to know if you said it or not, so just pretend like you did, right? Uh, so, a lot of you aren't going to have uh, access to the entire population. If you're talking about college students, you're not going to be able to talk to all, I don't know, 7,000 million college students that exist in the world, right? So you're not going to be able to do random sampling.
you will be able to do what is called convenience sampling or haphazard sampling. This is what sometimes people accidentally call random sampling, but convenience sampling is when you just go up to the you know, first 30 people that you can find, or maybe you make a post on your Facebook and you're like, hey, I need people to participate in my survey who wants to do it, right? That would be convenience sampling or haphazard sampling. It's not random because everyone in your population doesn't have an equal chance of being in your study. It can introduce bias because you might only choose people that you know. And if all of your friends are video game nerds, then your whole study is going to be filled with video game nerds. Nothing wrong with video game nerds, but it is a specific subset of a very diverse population. Now, some of you might not be satisfied with that, and I understand, right? You might need more from your sample, and I respect that. One thing you might want to do is what's called proportive sampling. So in proportive sampling, you have some criteria for participating in your survey. Now, first of all, all everyone in your survey will be over the age of 18, so I do not consider that uh, truly proportive sampling because you want your participants to be over the legal age of consent. So please do not do research on children. I will be very mad. I will be very disappointed. Uh, but what I, so maybe like you're doing a study on people who uh, drive cars and you're wondering if people who drive trucks versus people who drive uh, you know, regular sedans, uh, if they are, if there's a difference in aggression. Now, in order to do that study, you have to find people who drive sedans and people who drive pickup trucks, right? So people who walk, people who bike, uh, people who do other things, uh, who fly, uh, they are going to not be included in the study. So you might do a proportive sample and only include people who uh, drive a sedan or drive a truck, right? Uh, everyone else is excluded from the survey. So proportive sampling is when there's some criteria for participating in the study. Let's say you were doing a study on honor students versus non-honor students, right? And you knew that 15% of the student population was an honor student. So in order to make sure that your study reflects the actual population, you might make sure that, so if you had 100 people in your study, you might have 15 that were honor students and 85 that were not honor students so that the proportions and percentages in your study reflect that of the population. That is what is called quota sampling. If you're doing a gender study, you might make sure that it's about 50-50 balanced uh, as far as genders are concerned. Uh, the uh, and then if you are also being aware of the fact that, you know, there are multiple gender uh, identities, then you would also adjust accordingly. But you want to identify the proportions of the thing that you're measuring in your study and then make sure that it is reflected in your actual sample. So the proportions in the population have to be reflected in the sample. That is quota sampling. So that is it for chapters six and seven. They are pretty straightforward, uh, but they are important concepts, especially as you get into designing the methods section of your paper. So make sure that you are familiar with all this material, right? Understand the difference between participation and observation. Look at the things that can be problematic in questions. So be able to look at a question and identify what's wrong with it. Is it double-barreled? Is it loaded? Understand the difference between 
between the sample and the population, and also uh, be aware of the four different types of sampling that we discussed in class. So uh, random sampling, haphazard sampling, proportive sampling, and quota sampling. And again, wash your hands, come on. I told you that so many times and you just never listen. It's gross. 20 seconds, sing the song. <laughs>